You stay here, part two. Ray aimlessly threw a dirt clod and said, Shut up, I told you, I'm going to cover the walls and ceiling in my bedroom. Right, your bedroom, said Freckles, then to Shane. So, what do you say? Nuh-uh. Come on, man, said Splotchy. Give it here, said Ray, licking the hair above his lip and moving forward. No. Freckles was losing patience. Shane felt his own face go hot as if he were unable to hold back tears. But it was the heat of anger. They were not going to take it away from him. He would defend this mannequin, dummy, whatever it was, to the death. He wasn't about to let go. There seemed to be some honor involved. Was that possible? Something more than his father returning to find the mannequin gone. Freckles seemed to sense Shane's resolve and tried a different tack. I'll give you a dollar for the dummy. It's a mannequin. Oh, said Ray, a mannequin, Splotchy mocked. It's a dummy, kid. Dummy ain't even got any balls. Freckles kicked the mannequin hard between his, the legs. Shane felt fear like he'd be the next thing kicked. Stop it. Gonna make me? They started to pull the dummy away from Shane, but he hung on. Ray grabbed Shane by the hair and yanked. Shane's scream was drowned out by what he sounded like a jet making a low-level pass. They all stopped and looked up, but the sky was empty. Then they saw that the scraping roar was a car leaving the road and tearing across the field, bucking across remnant rows and crunching gravel. Dad, in the station wagon. Run for it, said Freckles, and they did. They laughingly bolted for their truck and were speeding away by the time Shane's father arrived. Who was that, said his father. Shane couldn't answer. His words liquefied into a sob. What the hell happened, said his father, looking over Shane's shoulder at the mannequin and parachute. Shane? They, try, they tried to take it, Shane hiccuped. Stop crying. Who? T teenagers? Stop crying. Shane wiped his eyes and nose on his sleeve. He was mad at himself for crying, but he was also greatly relieved that Dad was back. You okay? Yeah. I got the seat. He went to the back of the car, opened the tailgate, landed next to some tennis courts, and these people playing doubles didn't even notice it come down. Shane looked to the highway. The teenager's truck was long gone. They, he began. They what? Shane swallowed a sob. What? Shane realized from the tone of his father's voice that there was nothing to do but load the mannequin into the back of the station wagon along with the ejection seat. That was what Dad wanted, what he expected. Even if they caught the boys, they'd just lie and say they were kidding around and Shane would look like a little baby. He already felt diminished enough. Help me with this thing, said, the, said his father, and they loaded it into the back of the car. Can we keep him? Shane asked hopefully. No, I called the ops officer out at the base. We're bringing it in. Before his father closed the tailgate, he put a hand on Shane's shoulder. Want to ride him back? You can sit in the ejection seat. Sure, yeah. Get in. Shane climbed in back. He sank down into the seat, it and the mannequin floating atop the pair of foamy white silk parachutes. His father closed the tailgate and got in behind the wheel. They took the back road to the base, passing an empty old farmhouse with a collapsing barn. An ancient truck had been left to rust in the weeds, scrub oak growing straight up through the floorboards, its branches reaching out the windows like monster arms. Shane held the mannequin's hand for a while, until doing so felt silly. At the base gate, Shane's father bypassed the line of cars waiting to get in for the air show. The guards stopped them, even though the station wagon had all the proper decals. Sir, I'm going to have to ask you to go to the end of the line. I spoke to the ops officer. You guys had a premature punch out over town. You aware of that? He jerked his thumb, indicating the back of the car. I'm bringing it back. The guard peered at Shane, sitting in the ejection seat. Very good, sir. The guard saluted reluctantly. Shane's father blithely returned the salute and nodded, proceeding through the gate. Overhead, the Blue Angels executed a vertical climb and split away from each other like startled birds. The car passed Dad's familiar squadron hangar, then veered left past the control tower until they came to a run-down hangar with some vintage aircraft out front. Shane's father parked, got out, and said, You stay here. Shane sat there, watched his father bounce smartly up the stairs. After several minutes, his father reappeared alongside a 19-year-old sailor who looked confused and slightly annoyed. The sailor's last name, Campo, was stenciled on his blue work shirt. They approached the car, and his father opened the tailgate. Get out, Shane. After his father and Campo had removed the mannequin, the seat, and both parachutes, his father asked Campo what he was going to do now. Campo shrugged and said, I don't know, sir. Someone should be by to pick it up. Did anyone call to say we were coming? No, sir. Shane's dad frowned. Do you know if anyone even went out to search for this? Campo looked down at the mannequin. No, sir. I mean, it's just a dummy, sir. I know that sailor, but it landed in town. You mean no one even said anything? The Blue Angels did another low-level flyby. Campo waited until they passed. I don't know, sir. This was clearly not what Shane's father wanted to hear. His jaw hardened and the sheen of sweat made his face seem like an acrylic mask. Campo waited. Finally, Shane's father dismissed him with a wave of his hand. Go back upstairs and finish watching your ball game, he said. Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. 
Campo left with a half-hearted salute. Shane's father limply shooed him away. Casual Saturday morning dad looked out of place here. They got back in the car. Shane waited for his father to start the car. They waited there for a minute. The mannequin now sat in the ejection seat on top of cloud-like parachutes against the wall. It looked like a cartoon of an ejection. For a long time, his father said nothing during the drive back. Then suddenly, how can you lose something like that over a civilian area and not send anyone to retrieve it? I don't get it. The question seemed directed at Shane, so he did his best to answer it. Maybe the pilot didn't notice until he landed. Impossible, believe me. When there's an ejection, you notice. What's an F-9? It's an old jet. How old? Dad didn't want to talk about the F-9 or anything else. Shane looked back at the empty space where everything had been. He would felt like a king riding in that ejection seat, mannequin trophy beside him. Tomorrow, they'd go to the air show, hopefully check up on what happened to their golden-faced friend. It would probably still be sitting against the wall of the hangar from the look of things. Shane sniffed. Now what? What? Why are you weeping? His father didn't have enough patience left to wrap the word weeping in the proper amount of solicitous padding, and it cracked hard against Shane's feelings. Shane grimaced in a horribly unattractive way, buck teeth digging into his lower lip. More out of a sense of duty than anything else, his father reached out to put a hand on Shane's shoulder, but Shane angrily reeled away and sulked against the passenger door. I'm not weeping. And it was true, he really wasn't. So what's your problem? Shane considered the question, but all he saw in his mind was the fog of what they'd been through and what should have happened. Finally, a vague thought, a fragment of honesty began to emerge, and Shane grabbed as many words as he could recognize and filled in the blanks. We shouldn't have left that guy back there. At first, Dad thought Shane was referring to Campo. Then he realized Shane meant the dummy that parachuted out of the sky. His father thought, Christ Almighty, and began to formulate a retort, some dismissive yet reassuring platitude. But the right words wouldn't come. There was something caught in his throat, some nagging thought short-circuiting everything. So Shane's father went back to the very beginning, to that first fizzling pop. He'd known what it was immediately. There's no mistaking that sound. Wonder what pilot screwed that particular pooch. They should ground the son of a bitch. In his own mind, he tried to go over how he might have handled such a situation, but the best he could come up with was, that never would have happened on my watch. End of story. The pride of this view gave him enough confidence to come back around to Shane's comment, and, after an attention-getting throat clear, said, we didn't leave him. We brought him back. Shane sat in the car, watched his father enter the shoe store. The impassivity of Dad's face betrayed a mind caught up in the practical considerations of an impending purchase. He knew his father was far away, deep into his head, pitting various factors against one another, assessing what this operation would require in terms of logistics, value, material, and always, somewhere in there, sacrifice. The End